Within this course, I'm going to be walking you through step-by-step -step how to build out a JavaScript-based HTML5 game from scratch. We're going to be including all the di different components, explaining them along the way, and explaining how the different functionality works within Canvas, HTML5, and JavaScript, and how they all work together. My name is Lawrence, and I've been a web developer for over 14 years, and I'm going to be sharing my knowledge with you. All of the source files are also going to be included. Uh, the editor that I'm going to be using is Brackets. Uh, so this is a free downloadable editor from Adobe. I'm going to include a resource file where we're going to have all of the resources used within this course, links to all the different uh, resource and information files. Uh, there's some CodePen files as well. So CodePen is an online editor which you can use in order to practice JavaScript, HTML, and CSS directly online. All of the code is going to be written from a blank template, starting with the HTML, bringing in the JavaScript source, and then we're going to be predominantly working with just the JS file, and this is going to be able to accommodate the entire game build. So all of this is going to be included step by step. How to build out the game from scratch, starting with the different variables to use, how to set up the canvas, how to uh, bring in images, load in images, adding in listeners, keyboard listeners, listening for key down functions, arrow keys, checking to see which keys are actually pressed, uh, also preventing uh, runoff of the various objects on the screen, and then some additional functionality of those objects, uh, some useful functionality here, and different ways to break apart and set up games, uh, looping of games, and animation of games, and then rendering out animations onto the canvas, doing collision detection, adding in different objects on the screen, and then moving around those objects on the screen. Also preventing them from running off the screen for movement, and then of course collision detection, and then drawing out different objects such as dots, so circular, and rectangles as well. And then finally drawing out those images on the screen and writing text onto the canvas to be able to complete a simple game like this uh, simulation of Pac-Man versus the two ghosts. It's encouraged that you do follow along and practice the code that we're discussing. Uh, even create your own versions of the code uh, using your own editor or using an online editor. So when you're ready, let's begin creating our first HTML5 game. Within this lesson, we're going to be talking about how to set up our HTML5 game. So the first thing that we want to do is declare the document type. And you do this by typing in doc and declaring it HTML. Uh, so this lets the browser know that this is an HTML5 document. And then I'm going to add in the opening and closing HTML tags, put some spacing in there. Uh, next thing that I want to do is set up head. So this, uh, this is where all of our meta information gets set up. Uh, and then I'm going to add in a title as well. So I'm going to just call it game tutorial. And now we're ready to set up body. So opening and closing body tags. So I do have the auto automatic uh, closing tags set up. I'm using brackets, so Adobe brackets. This is a free downloadable uh, editor. Um, which you could download yourself or you could use your favorite editor as well. Uh, so the other thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating some styling and I think for now I'm just going to keep it on page styling and then we're also going to link out to JavaScript 
So you create a brand new JavaScript file and link out to that as well. So I'm going to do script and do a source for the script. Uh, so I'm going to just call it js.js. And so this will pull in our JavaScript file and then we'll do a split screen uh, where I'm going to include the JavaScript because it's going to be the JavaScript that's going to add that functionality to your HTML5 game. And lastly, I want to add in Canvas. So this Canvas tag is one of the most crucial, important tags here uh, for your HTML5 game. Uh, save that, Got to tidy it all up. Actually, I actually have to select all and then I can beautify it. Uh, so this makes it uh, more readable. And then here within Canvas, I'm going to set a width 600 and I'm going to also give it a height of about 400. So I'll just do 400. And now when I go out to the page, so we no longer have a blank page, uh, we've got all of that. Um, now all of this template set up and it's ready to go. We've got to create the JavaScript uh, JS file as well. And then we're going to uh, build out the game from, from this point on. Within this lesson, we're going to talk about setting up and actually hooking into our canvas into our JavaScript. So there's a number of different ways to do that. You can actually even create the canvas using JavaScript. Uh, which we're going to show you as well how to do that. Uh, but for this example, we've actually just created it using HTML and now I'm going to assign it an ID. So I'm going to give it canvas. So I'm going to give it an ID of canvas space. And then now within my JavaScript, So I'm going to connect to it uh, using setting up Canvas and Canvas I'm going to do document get. So this is uh, working within the DOM because now that I've given it an ID I can actually isolate and pick up this particular element in the HTML5. So get element by ID so now I just have to indicate the ID of the element and then that's going to tie the canvas to this particular object in the HTML. Uh, so now we've got get element by ID. And now that we've identified it by the ID, now we can actually set our interaction, which we're just going to call CTX. And this is going to allow us to actually interact with the canvas in two-dimensional allow us to draw and update images and content within it. So pulling in this variable that we just set up, so using canvas, and then the method is get context, and the context is going to be 2D. Now that we've set up our JavaScript, uh, there's one thing important thing to note here because we are using the DOM and with the DOM we got to make sure that the actual page has loaded in order to interact with the DOM. Uh, so that's why we're actually going to take our JavaScript and we're going to move it below the DOM objects because otherwise it's actually not going to work if you're keeping it at the top there uh, and the page uh, if we're connecting the JavaScript over here, we're not going to be able to actually access our canvas there. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we're putting our JavaScript below so that all of this information gets loaded into the DOM and then we're ready to interact with that content. And now we're just going to add in just a quick test just to make sure that our HTML5 is actually hooked up and working. 
So we're going to type in some text into our canvas. So right now there's nothing in the canvas. We haven't loaded any information. And I'm going to type in some basic text. And it's just going to say, hello world. Close that off. And now I have to position where the text is. So over here within our hint here, we notice that the string text, number X, number Y. So this is going to be on our X axis. So location on our X axis, we can do something like 10. And our Y axis, uh, since we've got a height of 400, uh, maybe we can do something like 150. And then we've also got a max width as well. So if we want to limit the width of the content area or the text area that we're adding into our canvas, we can do there. Do that within the next comma. Uh, but right now we're just going to leave it at default because I don't want to have to set anything there. Uh, go out to our web page and refresh it and we see that we do have that hello world and this is on our on our canvas area. Uh, so one of the things too I'm going to set up within the style uh, just so that we can actually see where our canvas is. So I'm going to set up canvas and so this is going to apply to any canvases that I have on my page. So border solid one pick and I'm going to give it a color of black so save that or beautify that to make it more readable go back out refresh it so now that we've got a border so we can actually identify where our canvas is located so it looks like we're ready to begin interacting with our canvas and continue to build out our game which we're going to be doing in the upcoming lessons In this lesson, we're going to jump back a little bit as promised and we're going to look at a way of creating the canvas without typing it in HTML, without typing it within the HTML. I'm going to comment out the canvas, go back out to our web page, refresh that and we see that we don't actually have anything there. When we go to the source, that's commented out now and we're still linking out to our JavaScript. Uh, so within here, we're actually going to set up our canvas with using JavaScript. And this uh, saves us the trouble of setting that up here and then actually cooking it into the DOM and hoping that... Um, so what we had noticed within the previous lesson is that when I place my JavaScript above uh, the actual HTML contents, uh, we weren't able to connect into that particular canvas, that ID. And doing it this way will actually ensure that um, everything is loaded and that you are able to connect to it. So the first thing that we're going to do is do document. And we're going to create an element. And the element that we're creating is a canvas. And the next thing that we're doing is we're going to do CTX. So same thing that we did before. And we're just going to actually copy this out. Because at this point, uh, we're creating that within the DOM. And now we're hooking it on so that we can actually manipulate it with the CTX. And there's a few other things that we have to do. We actually have to give the canvas a height as well as a width. So we're going to stick with what we had up there at the top and I'm going to give it a height of 400 and a width of 600. So it's 400 pixels by 600 or I should say 600 by 400 horizontally. And then now what we need to do is we need to actually append this to the body tags. So we're going to append append a child into there and that's going to be that canvas object that we've just created. And then also if we wanted to we can write out to it on hello world. 
So now when I go out to the page, I refresh it, we actually get the same result that we did from the previous lesson. So this is the way to create it using JavaScript when the page loads. And it gives us essentially the same result that we were looking at in the previous lesson. So again, within the source code, we've um, commented that out. And in the next lesson, we're going to start getting into some more exciting stuff with HTML5 Canvas and actually start creating out some game elements. So now that we've gone over some of the basics of setting up Canvas on your website, uh, we can begin to start loading in some actual game components. And one of the first things that I want to load in is actually, I want to load in an image. Uh, so we're going to be making a Pac-Man, a mini Pac-Man type game where we're going to have this Pac-Man, we're going to have a random ghost, and we're going to create a dot, and when the Pac-Man eats the dot, then he can eat the ghost, but if the ghost gets the Pac-Man without uh, being blue or without being in the mode when the, the dot has been eaten, uh, then the Pac-Man's going to lose. So we'll just do a quick kind of scoring game like that. And uh, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use this uh, PNG file. Uh, so this PNG file has a number of different, uh, different modes, different icons here. So we've got our ghosts uh, and we've got our Pac-Man with the open mouth, uh, closed mouth, and all the way down. So we're going to be using all of these, uh, the blue ghosts as well. Uh, so let's begin with bringing in that image into our canvas. Uh, so in the last lesson, we talked about how to set up our canvas and how to bring it in with JavaScript. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to start removing out some of this here. And I'm going to change CTX to context. And we're going to keep this, uh, we're going to be setting up that, uh, that size here of height of 400, width of 600. So this is a good beginning for what we're going to have within the game. Uh, so what I want to do now is actually I want to load in the image. So I want to set up a brand new image. So I'm going to do main image and I'm going to equal it to new image and then again I'm going to use that same object so main image is my object actually this should be an equal sign and I'm going to do when main image is ready so when it's uh, loaded so by default I want to have a false here and I'm going to change it to true once it gets loaded. And main image ready, uh, or we're going to call this on load. So when the image finishes loading, we're going to run a particular function. Uh, and this function is going to check to make sure that it's ready. And if it's ready, it's going to set the ready to true. And it's going to launch the game rendering function. So on load, check, ready. So this is going to be our function that's going to check to see if uh, things are ready. And then over here is main image. So this is going to be the source of that image. So I'm going to use that same one that we were just looking at earlier. It's just called pack.png. So again, just to review what's happening here, uh, so I'm setting up a new image object uh, and I'm setting it, I'm giving it uh, ready, I'm, check, I'm changing to false by default. And when the image loads, it's going to run the function check ready and it's going to use the source pack.png as the source. So this means that I need to create that function here called check ready. Now I can't pass anything there in that function. And then I can just do this ready and I can set that to true. And I'm going to have another function within here. I'm going to call that play game. So once the image is loaded, it's going to end up running this function that's just going to do play game. 
I, I could probably uh, simplify it as well, just maybe put play game here when it's ready and loaded. Uh, but just in case I want to do something else, I'm going to actually keep that within this function. Uh, so this is kind of uh, preparing it for expanding for later possible expansion that uh, might be required within this game. And I'm just going to beautify that. Uh, so now we need to create one more function and it's going to be the play game function. And what this one is going to do is this is going to be the starting the game, the launching the game, that type of function. So again, just function, play game. So everything in here is once the game gets started, uh, so once our images are loaded, uh, then we can do whatever else we need to do in here. We launch this function, that's play game. And this function is actually going to launch one more function. It's going to be called render. And we're also going to be including uh, the loop in here as well within the play game method. And we're going to be getting into that later on. So what the render is, this is actually going to be where we're actually going to output the content on our within our canvas. And this is just going to be called function render. And so for now, what I want to do is I'm going to do context fill style and I'm going to give it a color. Uh, so and I'm just going to give it a color of black. Uh, so just for now, we're going to start out with this black background color. And I'm going to quickly go over uh, what we've just talked about as well. So black. And now I have to do the actual fill of the rectangle. So much like what we looked at before. So I'm going to start this off at 0 .00. 0 and I'm going to bring it all the way up. So here we have our numbers. So when we do fill rectangle, we need to have all four corner numbers. So we need to have the X, the Y, the W, and the H. So the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, uh, this is going to be the width and then the height. And with width and height, we can actually use this canvas width and canvas height. So that because we, we do want to fill up the entire, the entire canvas. And of course, if you didn't want to fill the entire canvas, uh, you would adjust this accordingly. So now we're just going to go back out to the page and there's not that much happening right now. We've got our black rectangle. It's filled black. So just to show you again, so we could literally have uh, whatever color we feel we want. Uh, so we can use hexadecimal, we can use RGB as well. Uh, and this will update the entire background and going back over what we've set up here. Uh, so to recap, so uh, this is what we looked at in the previous lesson where we created the canvas uh, context 2D. We appended it to the body tag within the HTML. Uh, we set canvas height of 400, width of 600. So probably just gonna swap, swap these around because normally we do width and then we do height. Uh, and then here we're just doing an image load. Uh, so we're setting up main image, giving it an object um, of image. We're doing ready, uh, which is going to be false. Uh, so this is something that we can or cannot use. Uh, again, depending on uh, what we're doing later on and how we're scaling it, uh, we might want to know uh, that we do have a value here of main image ready that will tell us if this image is loaded. Uh, so if we're loading multiple images, uh, then we do want to have that ability in order to tell that this image is loaded and other images is, have loaded as well. So again, this is for if we want to build that out. Uh, so over here, we're doing main image on load. And what's happening here, once the on load is complete, it's going to run this method called check ready, which is just over here. And this is here where we do the flipping the switch of false to true. 
and then we run one more function within here and this is the function and again this is uh, going on um, for scaling and upgrading within the code later on so right now it probably looks a little bit strange that we probably could have just done render when it's on load so we don't necessarily need those at this moment uh, but I've added them in um, because we are going to be using them and working with them as we progress through this course uh, so what's happening here is all we're doing is we're connecting back to that canvas uh, that we built originally up here and we're, we've got a few built-in functions here uh, so fill style so this is giving us the color that we're gonna fill it and then here we're doing a fill rectangle and these are the dimensions of the rectangle that we're filling up so in the next lesson we're gonna get into some really exciting stuff we're gonna start bringing through that image and then we're going to be doing some really cool stuff, making the images move around and so on. Uh, so this is coming up in the upcoming lessons, as well as we're going to build in the actual game loop and uh, perform some functionality there as well. Within this lesson, we're going to talk more about the image and adding in the image within our canvas. So in the previous lesson we looked at and we've got this image where we've got all of our different icons that we're going to be using within the game are contained within one image. Now of course you could have multiple images, you could load them all in, but what I'm doing for the purposes of this course is I'm going to just use this one image and I'm going to pick out certain pieces of the image that I'm going to show on the canvas. So for the Pac-Man, I'm going to show just the Pac-Man. For a ghost, I'm going to show a ghost. And it's actually going to make it a little bit easier for me uh, when I'm actually doing some functionality within, uh, within this that I'm not going to have to load multiple images. I've got it all contained within that one image. And as we saw in the previous lesson, we load in that one image and we're ready to go and use it. So now in order to actually add that image, it's going to be really easy because all we have to do is do the method draw image and this is going to do the whole functionality of uh, the image. We just need to answer a few vital pieces of information and the first one is when you do draw image, where is it getting the image source from? So over here, we've loaded it, we've loaded it into the object my main image so all I'm doing is just connecting main image that we've loaded previously and I'm drawing it out and then here I have to specify where I want to draw it so if I want to draw it zero zero so this would be right in the corner so going back out to our example so we're pulling that right up in the corner if I wanted to move it over on the X coordinates I could do that and then the Y coordinates um, I could move that around as well. So there are a bunch of additional uh, additional parameters that you can add in. Uh, so this is by default, this is the simplest that we can do. Uh, so we can also add in a um, second set of parameters and we can also add in additional parameters um, within another line where we can be picking out a certain piece of it. Uh, so I've got an example here within CodePen.io. Uh, so this is a CodePen.io that's, um, I can provide a link for this as well. Uh, so here we've got an example of, we've got our draw image. And so what we're doing right now at the moment is we're just drawing the image as it is. We're moving it over. So ours was, I think, 40 by zero. So we're putting it over here. Uh, so as you saw, when we did load it, actually there was a whole bunch of additional parameters. Uh, so the next one is gonna be the, the width uh, and the height of the image. So if I wanted to have an image 20 by 20 and I'm taking that whole entire image, I'm making it 20 by 20, I can do it that way. Uh, so if I wanted a 120 by 120, I could do that. If I wanted it even larger, 
do 400 by 400, and so on. So this determines the height of the, the image that we're going to be using. Uh, so the next set of parameters is actually going to be, um, it's going to actually uh, change this around quite a bit. Uh, so what we want to be doing is we want to be able to pick out one of these ghosts here, or, or actually the Pac-Man, and isolate that particular image and bring that into our canvas. Uh, so we need some more coordinates here that we need to add in. So the next set of coordinates that we're adding in is going to be the X and Y coordinate of the top left corner of the sub rectangle of the source of the image. So if I wanted to pick out, so we look at the source of the image, so this is this image over here. So maybe I can pull that onto a separate window here. And we can see that this is the source of the image. And maybe I want to just get uh, the rhinoceros's face. So just roughly looking at this, um, when I go into the source of the image, I can roughly pick out that this is probably about 60 pixels in. This is probably about 150 down. So I'm going to just go with that and I'm going to go 60 in and do 150 down and as we see we don't really see anything happening up here because these have actually changed now um, so we're no longer looking at uh, these coordinates being the width and height of the actual destination uh, canvas image we're looking at the source image uh, next the width and height of the source image so I'm going to pull in and so now we see that if we take the coordinates 60 by 150 so that brings us actually just into right about there and we take 10 by 10 of that and we output it as 4 so maybe we'll just change this to 100 by 100. So we're actually outputting this 100 by 100. Uh, so it's actually bringing in the face a little bit more as well. So just to go over this again, because this is actually going to be fairly complex. Uh, so if I want to pick out, um, so the first thing, the first parameter there is fairly straightforward. It's just going to be the image. And the next four are going to have to do with the source image. So the X and Y of the source image, and then the width and the height of the particular uh, piece or chunk of information that we're getting. So even if I reduce this, we see that it actually uh, stretches it out. Because now all I'm doing is I'm selecting out 20, a piece of 20 from there, but it's being elongated to 100 when we go out to our destination. So if I was to bring this down to 20, then if these two match, then we're actually picking out a slice of that. Uh, so these, this is 150, so it doesn't necessarily match with that. Uh, so again, this is um, uh, fairly uh, complex, but um, visually, uh, what we're going to do here is that we have to look at the source first and then we have to pick out the destination from our own image. So going back to our source code and trying to pick out, so now that we've got the coordinates there, so now we have to actually update this and we can set uh, a width and a height. And pulling out all of that information here, so this is uh, where the position on the image that we're trying to pick out. So this is 320, the point at 320. Uh, the next point is Y, so that's zero. So that's right up here is where we're picking it out. We want to do 32 picks across, 32 picks down to pick out that particular piece of the image. So that's where we get that 32 and 32. And then the other four uh, numbers are where we're locating. So 0, 0 is where we're locating. So if I wanted to set it at 50 and 50, I could set that. And 
If I want to keep the Pac-Man the same size, I can do 32 and 32, and that's going to shrink our Pac-Man down. Uh, so we can actually change this and make our destination Pac-Man as big as we want. So we can make him really big if we want, and we can bring him all the way back down to his default size there. Uh, so I'm going to stick with the size of I'm going to stick with a size of uh, 32. And then in the next lesson, we're going to be talking more about how to make this figure dynamic and in order to start moving them around the screen and start having some added functionality to our game. Uh, but this is how to pick out the image and um, so loading that pack.png and then isolating that particular piece of the image and extracting it out onto the canvas. So now within this game, what I want to do is I actually want to make some of this stuff dynamic. And what we're going to be doing in the later lessons is what we had mentioned earlier, we're going to be looping through uh, this rendering and what's actually going to be happening is that we're going to be clearing out that canvas and redrawing everything over and over again frame by frame and that's how we're going to have movement interaction calculations for the game and so on so that's all going to be done within this render function uh, so for now what I want to do is I want to be able to isolate this uh, this part of the image because as we look at I've got this mouth opening and closing, I've got this up and down, so I want to actually set values for these because I want to have the ability to change them dynamically as events happen within the game and as things change. Uh, so I do want to have that ability to have uh, dynamic interaction. So this is going to be, I'm going to call it pack mouth. And the reason I'm calling that is because our mouth is going to open and close, uh, so this is what we're just going to call it um, in order to identify it as being the mouth, and then pack direction, and this is the actual direction that our character is going to be moving in, and we can actually pull all of this stuff in within one uh, within one object. So we knew we do need to create a player object and this can hold a lot of uh, variables and values. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create over here and then I'm going to create it as player x player y and I'm going to have this pack mouth and pack directory object. So over here instead of uh, being a fixed position so I still have yet to create these objects so player x player Y. So that's going to give me my coordinates of the player and I'm just going to turn these into objects as well. So these are going to be four objects and I'm just going to go up here and I'm going to preset, uh, preset the player object. And the way that we set objects, so variable player equals uh, curly brackets. So x, so by default, I'm going to give x a starting position of 50. I'm going to give y a starting position of 100. And then we had one that we called pack mouth and I'm going to give that the value of 320 that was there by default and then I had another one called pack direction and that one was zero because that's where it's actually going to change uh, when we change um, change directions uh, we're actually going to be showing a different image as the direction changes uh, so for right now this is probably all we need to select uh, these values of 32 
Uh, so if we want to make them bigger and smaller, if we want to have that happening dynamically, uh, we could add that in as well. Um, so instead of being 32, we could change those dynamically. So if we wanted to, I'm just going to call it piece size. And for now, it's going to be 32. That should be a comma. And then, of course, if we had uh, different dimensions, so if we had a different uh, horizontal size, a different vertical size, we'd have to update that as well. So now, um, now we can begin to add in some dynamic functionality as well within to our game. So for now, I'm actually going to change this back to 32 so it fits on one line nicely because uh, that was getting a little bit long and then of course if if the need be we can always change that back to the size there so we're actually not going to use the size value and within the next lesson we're going to talk more about how to getting uh, to, to set up your keyboard uh, functionality uh, so we're going to be getting into that uh, so for now, for thin this lesson, we're just going to finish this off with setting up some scoring information. Because just like with any good game, you do need to have scoring. So I'm going to set a font. Now you don't need to set a size. Uh, you can just use the default values of fonts. Uh, but for this tutorial, I'm just going to set in a size here of 20 picks. Uh, Verdana. Uh, font and I have to also do uh, the fill style because we're using blue if we change it to black our, our default text uh, it's not going to be visible so I'm actually going to make the text white and if you notice there's a pattern here on what we're doing so the fill style is going to refer to the next actual action that's going to fill so if I didn't set a fill style uh, it would take it as blue so I definitely want to make sure I set a brand new fill style because uh, I do want to have a different color for the text and then over here is where I'm actually going to write in the text information so I'm going to give the Pac-Man and of course we should set up a score and here I'm just concatenating a string here in JavaScript so this should be fairly straightforward and I'm going to do a score for the ghost as well and maybe I can set up ghost here and then now I have to select where I want to position it uh, so just like the image I can set up that property that value there the parameter there as what I want displayed and then here's where I position so uh, X first and then Y second so I'm gonna put it at 2 and 18 uh, quickly go back out to our page refresh it And I had to zip back here quickly because I do have to set up those score values because that's throwing an error. So I have to set up variable score. And it's going to equal it to zero. And variable g score and equal that to zero. So now when I go back out and refresh it, uh, so there, there we have our text. Um, and our scoring and then what we're going to do as well we're going to have that score increasing um, as different actions and different things happen within the game so within this lesson we're going to get into some really cool stuff where we're going to actually be having some interaction happening uh, keyboard clicks they're going to get tracked and um, then something is going to happen once they get tracked. So first we need to set up an object. So we're just going to call it key click. And we're going to have just a blank default object that we're going to be using. And then here we're going to set up some event listeners. So add event 
uh, add event listener and we're going to listen for the event of key down so this is uh, pulling in the DOM and then adding um, adding uh, different events so we're going to have a function event and we do have to pass that parameter there and we want to have that false and then within here uh, is where we're going to actually set up the event so we're just going to call it key click so this is that object that we just set up up here and then we're getting this event information and we're going to get the actual key code and this should be a period because we're getting the key code from uh, from that event object and we're going to pass this over into another function uh, so for now what I'm going to do is console log that out so we'll launch um, just back out to here open up our console here so I'm using uh, I'm using Chrome so there's a spelling error there somewhere go back out so now we see that when I touch on the keyboard we're getting these objects that are sent in uh, so it's actually taking in and doing that event listening uh, so these are just when I touch the keyboard I get these objects happening uh, and so we're, we're uh, got to pass over the key code and also within this key click object so we're actually not passing anything so we're not putting anything uh, we have to actually set it as being true uh, and so now whenever we click a key we're actually going to get a click uh, when we go key click we're actually going to get the ASC character code for the key that we're clicking so this is down this is left this is up and this is right so we see that it's, it's actually building up if I put in space I believe space was 32 and each uh, different key within the keyboard is going to return a second uh, value within there uh, so this actually uh, we probably have to start removing out uh, objects because we don't want to have all of these objects always all true uh, and we do want to have uh, removing those events so we want to add in a second event and this is going to be key up and this is going to void that first event and what it's going to do it's simply going to delete out that key click event so we should clear that out so every time the key gets pressed in uh, we're gonna pick up that value and every time it gets lifted up we're gonna lose the rest of the values so it gets cleared out every time we raise the key and this is gives us the ability to return back that uh, one value that we're looking for and then these are the values that we're actually gonna look for when we uh, when we do our calculations and we see here that sometimes if you do press a bunch of keys at once it does pass through more than one value uh, so this is something we're gonna look for as well within the object and that's why we're using an object because we're getting uh, a number of different values that can get passed through within here uh, so again within the next lesson uh, we're gonna get into some more interesting stuff uh, so for now we're just gonna set up an additional function and I'm just going to call it move and I'm going to send that key click value within a parameter there and then I'm going to just set up brand new function so another one there and I'm going to call this one move so this will have everything to do with moving around the screen and uh, we're going to check for particular values that we're passing over so we know that we're passing over those key click values so uh, we know 
that once we've passed the, that over, uh, then we have to do something dynamic with the calculation of where our player is facing, and then again, render that out. So maybe what we can do for now is we'll render that out, and whenever a key gets clicked, I'll do player x, and of course we're going to change this uh, coming up as well. So now when I go back out and refresh it, so whatever key I'm pressing right now, we see that we do have our moving functionality. And in the next lesson is going to be some more interesting stuff where we're actually going to make the mouth open and close as we're moving around. And then we're also going to add in the different directions, detect what key has actually been clicked, and uh, run that particular, uh, set those particular values for the keys that get clicked. So that's coming up in the next lesson. Within this lesson, we're going to add some additional functionality uh, that we've um, started out with in the last lesson where we added the event listeners. Uh, so then we set up a function where we're actually uh, look, listening for that move, picking up that key that was pressed, and then we're going to do some actions uh, depending on what key was pressed. Uh, so there's a few more values here that I want to set up. So I actually want to set up a speed value. And this is going to determine how fast the character is going to move across. Uh, so this is something, again, that we want to make dynamic. And all of these variables, whenever you're setting variables, uh, this gives you the ability to change them uh, within the script. Uh, and then this is one of the reasons why we like to set so many different variables in the beginning of the game and set those up so that we can have the ability to change any one of these. So within this lesson, we're going to be looking at changing the X, the Y, uh, using the speed, and we're also going to change this direction value. Because uh, again, going back to the image that we're using, so when the Pac-Man's going down, we actually want to change, um, we want to change uh, which way he's facing. And this is one of the good reasons why um, using an image file like this is because I've got all of the required images right within this one PNG file. So getting back to uh, the movement, so I'm going to do a bunch of conditional statements. So I'm going to do if start at 37 in key click. So this is the uh, this value that we're passing through here within the function. And we want something to happen. Uh, so what we want to do if it's 37 is the left key. So we want to actually do player x minus equal and we're going to do player speed. So that's going to give us that dynamic value. So that should be an equal sign. Uh, so this is going to subtract the speed. And then also I want to set the direction. So player pack direction. And uh, so the going back to our image, um, if I'm going uh, by default, going right, it's going to be 0. These are all 32 by 32. So 32 is here, so this is going down is 32. So 64 is going left. So I'm going to set that pack direction equals 64. And then I'm going to do this for all the other keys as well. So we've got a number of different keys, and the good thing about the arrow keys is they're all consecutive. So I've got 37, 38. So 38 is actually going to be going, going up, so it's the up key. Uh, so within 38, we have to use the Y coordinate, we have to do speed, and our direction is going to be 96, I believe, from the calculations. 
Uh, next, we want to do 39. So 39 is going to be X. So this is where we had our default initially. So we're just adding it. Uh, the player speed and our direction is going to go back to 0. And then 40 finally is going to be um, incrementing Y, so going down. So we have to do Y there, change this to a plus, and our direction is going to be the last one there that's available is 32. Uh, so just a quick look at this, and we should be good to render this out. Uh, so now going back out here, let's see what happens when we touch the arrow keys and we see that we do have our movement in place. Uh, so quite a few things that are coming up in the upcoming lessons. Uh, so I do want to have that mouth opening and closing. Uh, so that's going to be something that's going to be fairly easy to set. Uh, also, um, we're going to also have to make sure that we don't uh, go past our limits here of the canvas. So canvas width and canvas height. And when we do pass the, width, the limit, I want to set it back to this side, so it's coming out of here. So much like when you're playing Pac-Man, you go off onto the right and you come in from the left. And I'm going to do that as well for the up and down. So when you go down, when you get off screen, you can actually be up here and coming down. And then we're going to add in that same functionality for the ghosts as well. Add in a power up, uh, power up pill or dot. Uh, so that we can eat that and chase after some ghosts. So that's all coming up in the next lessons. So now I want to add in that mouth movement and when the player passes the edge of the canvas we want to reset that player value. So I can add all of that within here. So I'm going to do quickly beautify that a little bit um, then here I'm going to do if player X is greater than or equal to and I'm going to do canvas width I'm going to do canvas width minus 32 so that even though as soon as um, he's pretty much touching the edge there uh, I can flip them back over into um, the zero position so I can set up player X and give them a value of zero. And sometimes with these values you do have to play around a little bit with it. Uh, so this one, so once uh, Y, if it goes canvas height minus 32, we're going to set y at 0. And then the next two, so I'm going to check actually if player x is now less than 0. So uh, keep in mind that you want, um, you don't want to set it equal to 0 because I'm setting player x at 0 over here and if I'm looking for it to be uh, less than or equal to zero then when it hits zero over here I'm gonna get a conflict over here so you gotta uh, really make sure that uh, you're not overlapping your values uh, so that's why it's always good to to make sure that you do check those over so now I'm gonna set a value of player X and I'm gonna give them a value of canvas width minus 32 and same thing for y canvas height minus 32 and then lastly what I want to do so we'll just show you how this works and then we'll set the mouth uh, which is actually something that I wanted to do because that's um, gonna add some nice functionality uh, but see that we've we do have this working now and now to set up our opening and closing mouth so I think that this is a pretty neat part of it 
And it's again, it's going to be really easy to do because it's all contained within that one image. So I don't actually have to be flipping uh, images over. So if uh, this value is 320, we're going to do something. And if it's not 320, then we're just going to set it to 320. So if it's not 320, I'm going to set it to 352. And here I'm just going to do an else. And here I'm going to set it to 320 so that the next time around uh, it does hit that value there. And it resets it over to 352. So uh, now, um, just to kind of go over this, how this is going to work. Uh, so every time the key gets pressed every time the Pac-Man moves. Um, it's going to flip through the two options here for where the mouth is going to be located. It's going to move this image needle, the selection area, from 320 point to 352. And this is where we've got the mouths that are open. And again, this is where it works really, really well with uh, these types of PNGs where you just load the whole thing in and then you can just move between uh, the different spots uh, using uh, using JavaScript in order to select all those different spots. So now we got to test it out, make sure that it's working and see there we've got our mouth opening and closing up and down and everything seems to be looking uh, the way that we need it to, to work. And of course, you could always slow down that uh, movement. Uh, if you had multiple positions of the mouth, you could slow that down, uh, have different things happening, and so on. If you've got a character that's walking, uh, you can add in all the different uh, points there in order to make the movement look natural. And that's one of the reasons why I, I really like Pac-Man, because it's uh, very straightforward. Uh, you don't have a lot of moving parts. You have an opening and closing mouth, uh, which makes it really easy to render that out. So in the next lesson, uh, we're going to get into uh, some additional stuff where we're uh, rendering out the... We're actually doing some animation. Uh, we're going to add in the power dot, uh, and then we're going to start adding in some enemies to turn it into a more interesting game. Within this lesson, we're going to look at request animation frame. Uh, so this is going to be something that is relatively new. Uh, so not all of the older browsers are going to support this. Uh, so over here, they do have a browser compatibility chart here to let you know if browsers are compatible. So do uh, take a look at this if you're working on older versions or if your game has to be compatible with Internet Explorer. Uh, there are ways to get this to become compatible. Uh, so here you can actually um, set the different animation uh, values here. So that uh, within this lesson, we're just going to be working with the window request animation frame. Uh, you can also accomplish this by using intervals, uh, but uh, probably the, the best way, the modern way to do this is to do this request animation frame. And what this does is this uh, takes over that, that uh, looping of those intervals and all we have to do is go into our code here, uh, look back on what we're doing here and play game. And if I add this into uh, request animation frame play game, it's going to continuously render this out. So just to show you what's happening here. And maybe I'll just set a quick value Maybe we'll just increment the score there uh, just for now, just to show you what's happening here. And I'm going to list out the value of score. Go back out to our game, refresh it, and we see that uh, this is roughly every second. Uh, it's looping through that particular function. And we see that it's actually updating the screen there. So this is a really good animation interval. 
Uh, and this is um, one of the things that's important when you're creating a game uh, is to have this ability to loop through and continuously run through functions. So it's going to be different than when you're designing a website or something like that where you're looking for more of a linear process. You constantly want to be able to uh, to refresh and recalculate what's happening within your game and this is what that request animation frame allows you to do to run through that function over and over again and if you have any calculations or if you need anything to happen then you could add that all in the frame so all I'm doing for mine is that I'm rendering this out and again of course I could just copy this out I could get rid of this render and I could have all of it within the play game uh, so sometimes depending on what your game structure is, uh, you can do it that way, but we do want to have the ability to add in additional functionality and grow out our game, and that's why we've got all of these different uh, functions, and that's why we've got them grouped in this type of fashion. So I'm going to actually change this to black, to have a fill of black. Uh, so within this lesson, uh, we're going to start getting into... Uh, adding in um, the enemies uh, and also making some functionality for the enemy. So one of the first things that I want to do is I want to actually draw my the enemy um, and I'm going to set up so we set up um, this object here that controls the player information so maybe we need to set up another object here that controls our enemy information uh, so we're not going to need any of this stuff necessarily, although um, we might need we might need some values there. Uh, but for now, we're just going to keep them the same. Um, I'm going to just change the X and the Y, so it's not immediately on top of the player. And I'm going to render out the enemy. So from here, all we need to do is we just need another draw image. And actually, I'm going to do the enemy before uh, the Pac-Man. And this is another thing to keep in mind, that when you're drawing out stuff on the canvas, this is going to be in order. And this is why we actually do the uh, rectangle first uh, in order to clear up our canvas, that we're doing the black, we're doing the canvas size, and we're doing all of this stuff first because we want all of this to actually be some of the first pieces that we see. And over here, um, if I want to put the score, um, basically now the ghost and the Pac-Man are going to be able to go on top of the score. So it's all layered uh, in order of what's coming in first there. Uh, so now um, we need to draw out, so again we're going to be using that main image, so that actually doesn't change. I have to set a value for here, uh, so I'm going to just set zero for now. Direction, so there's no direction for the ghost, so 0, 0, 32, 32 is going to pick up our first red ghost, 0, 0 point 32 by 32. And now we need to set in their coordinates where they're going to be located. And we're just going to keep him at 32 and 32. So it's really easy to add in an enemy. And as we can see here, there's our, our ghost. And in the upcoming lessons, we're actually going to animate him. And again, this came to where the layering is. So now whenever our Pac-Man is traveling, he's on the top layer, and that's why he can go on top of the ghost there. And again, always keep in mind how you're layering, how you're stacking uh, what's happening on the canvas. And that's uh, dependent on the order that you're outputting the code. So in the next lesson, uh, we're gonna maybe animate the ghost and then we're going to finish the game off by adding in a power dot, uh, which is going to give us the ability to eat the ghost. So that's all coming up in the next lessons. So within games, oftentimes you need to have uh, random things happen, random uh, values returned. So I always like to include a simple function 
where I can pass over a number and return a, val a random uh, value back for that number. So I just simply do something like return and then math floor to bring it back to a, a actual value and then math random because when we just do math random we get that uh, zero dot and whole bunch of um, values there so I want to multiply this by n which is the parameter that we pass there within this function the my number and then I like to do plus one uh, so this should give me a random number from 0 to uh, this particular value or from 1 to uh, whatever that value is and of course you might have a different formula that you, that you want to work with or you want to randomize it or change some of these values uh, but for the purposes of this lesson I'm keeping it really simple where I'm just going to be able to return that back and the reason I do that is because I actually want to set a random ghost so I don't want to have just that one ghost uh, lurking around I want to be able to set a random one uh, so one of the things here is I think I got to set I'm gonna set a value here so I'm gonna uh, break these apart and just comma separate them save a little bit of space here and I'm gonna set up my ghost as having a false value and this is going to give me the ability to uh, check to see if the ghost exists if it doesn't exist uh, when I'm rendering out the content I'm actually going to render out my ghost information as well and again this is all dependent on how and where you want to use this uh, but most of the time you can do most of your functionality here within that rendering uh, you could also set that up here within the play game if you didn't detect a ghost uh, you could create one there at that point as well uh, so a number of different ways that you can uh, enter that in uh, so if you want to keep this the rendering part really clean with just canvas information um, this is a, a good great place to do that as well uh, but for now for what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna render out the the ghost within the render function so I'm going to check and see if ghost exists and if it doesn't exist then I'm going to create him or update his information here uh, so if he doesn't exist I know I need to set a number for him so I'm gonna or what I'm doing here is I'm setting uh, a number for him and then this is where uh, which image I'm actually going to draw out so I'm going to be drawing out ghost numbers. So this is going to give me the ability to actually not just have the red ghost. I want to maybe have the orange one, the pink one, the teal one, the purple one. So there's five different ones. So I'm going to do my num5 and I'm going to multiply it by 64. and also I'm gonna give them a random X and Y position so I'm gonna give them enemy X and again this my num function there and I'm gonna just give them a random spot on the map there and also I'm gonna give them a random Y position So this is going to give me a random ghost color, random location. And as we can see, it's continually doing that right now. Um, so actually, I think there's an error there in the calculation. So what I'm going to remove that out. Because I'm not, not actually calculating in the zero value. Uh, so that's better. So I don't I don't actually see the Pac-Man there. I see all the different ghosts, which is exactly what I want. But I actually want to be able to set this at false. 
so I only create that one ghost. So that was the issue there where I'm creating a bunch of them, but I did want to see to make sure that I'm creating the ghosts properly. Uh, so now when I do ghost equals true, I should only have one ghost. And it's going to be a lot easier to follow what's happening here as well. And another thing that I might want to add in as well is I don't want them too close to the top. So I'm going to give them a plus 30 there to give them a position, random position, but actually have them down below where the, the content is up there. So give them roughly more of a centered position. Uh, so in the upcoming lessons, uh, we're going to talk about how we can actually move our ghost around. Uh, so it's coming up in the next lesson. So now that we've created our enemy, now we need to have some movement for our enemy. Uh, so one of the things I want to update here when we created him, I want to check to make sure to see if he's moving. So maybe we could even do something where we've got Uh, so the moving actually is going to be a value of how many uh, how many spaces or how many seconds he moves in the same direction. Uh, so I do want to give him the ability to move around in random directions, but I don't want him to be uh, buzzing back and forth randomly up and down. I want uh, him to make a decision on which direction he's going, uh, travel that direction for a little while, and then once that uh, calculation is up, so there's going to be a countdown on this moving. It's going to go down. Once it hits zero, it's going to reinitiate. It's going to reevaluate uh, which direction he needs to go. And I'm going to add all of this stuff into the rendering function. So here uh, we set up our ghost. And what I'm going to do, I'm not going to add in the moving calculation in here uh, just because I want it to reset every time when it hits zero. So it's always going to be the same thing. So what we have is enemy moving. And once it's less than zero, um, then what I want to do is I want something to happen. And here is where we pick out our enemy moving and we're going to give it a random value. So we're going to use that my num again. And maybe we'll pick something like random 30, multiply it by 3. And again, you might have a different calculation that you want to use here. I'm going to add in 10 because I don't want it to go underneath 10. And this should give us uh, roughly um, a random number for it to count down. Uh, also, maybe I want to change the speed on him. Uh, so I'm not just checking it. So I did set a speed of 5. So maybe I want him to have actually a random speed. So it's not always going to be moving at the same speed. Uh, so every time he changes direction, there's going to be a possibility that he might change his speed as well. Now also um, the way that we're doing it here because I'm placing it within this rendering area uh, it's gonna um, really move them along quicker and again it might have been better to create another function uh, and bring this out uh, but for now I'm gonna keep it within the render uh, but this is something to keep in mind that this is gonna be a quicker uh, quicker uh, response because this is going to be run every second as opposed to the person and the key clicks and their movement. So I think a movement of a rough number to 4 or to 5. And then here is where we're actually going to set directions. So I'm just going to set direction equals 0 and I'm going to do direction X and direction Y. So I'm going to set them both to zero.
And the reason that I wanted to do that is because going on over here, I actually want to pick out which direction he should be moving, either up or down, left and right. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to do, so I'm going to take this randomly generated number that I have over here and actually come to think of it, I need to probably add in um, something to either make it odd or even. Uh, so I'm going to make it odd or even with that 2 there. So now we can do enemy moving and if it's uh, modulus, if there's a remainder, uh, then it will do one thing and if there's no remainder, it'll go the other direction. So the first calculation, so if there's a remainder, and I'll add in the else there as well, uh, so what we want to do, we want to move it left and right if there's no remainder and if there is a remainder we're going to move it up and down. So 50-50 chance of the direction that he's going to be taking. And I also, I want to actually take into consideration when I do this uh, calculation, I want to take a look and see where the player's located. And if the player is actually less than my location, then I'm going to send them that way. And if the player is going to be more, then I'm going to send them the other way. So I'm going to do here, I'm going to do enemy direction x equals minus, so from here it's going to actually be subtracting the speed. And else, so another else statement there, and the opposite is going to be adding in the speed. So the direction is going to be uh, the speed value, and then of course this could change. And then here, alternatively, I'm going to do the y's here. So I'm going to change all of these to y. So this should uh, give us uh, direction to go in. And then uh, just before we draw out our enemy, uh, now here we have to add in if the increments. So much like what we did here with the keys, the keyboard, where we added in player, we got to do the same for the enemy. So enemy x equals enemy x plus enemy direction x, and enemy y equals enemy y plus enemy direction y. And one other thing, I want to actually decrease this moving value so that we can reset every once in a while. So roughly whatever this uh, calculation turns out to be, uh, this is in how many seconds they do a reset. And it's always going to be random. And the reason we make it random is so that no one can really determine uh, what the pattern is going to be for the, for the enemy. So I just realized that going back to enemy, I never did set uh, this direction X and direction Y. So I do have to add those in before it will work because uh, otherwise it's just overriding this X and Y. So it's not exactly working because I haven't set the object up properly. So going back out here, refreshing it, we see that now it's working properly where we do have our ghost uh, moving around randomly and he's actually always moving towards the player. Uh, so when I refresh it, again, different ghost, and uh, that movement So if we don't want him actually ever standing still, I can change that random value instead of being 5, maybe I can change it plus 1. 
so that there will always be one value there that's being returned. And if you notice too, now our ghosts are actually running off the screen. Uh, so we have to add in that same functionality that we had in our Pac-Man when we go off of the screen that he shows up on the other side. So that's coming up in the next lesson. So much like what we had to do for our Pac-Man to prevent him from running off the stage, we have to actually do the same thing for the ghost. Uh, so I can simply pretty much copy out this and then just update uh, the text here. So after we've done our calculation, I want to make sure that we don't run off the page. So first one, we want to change all of these players to enemy. Because we've already done this and a lot of times when you're using uh, different engines that are available, uh, they already have these types of things pre-built. Um, or you could come up with your own uh, library that does this type of thing where um, it automatically detects the height, the width, and uh, these values can be automatically fed in. Uh, so, But for the purposes of this lesson, we're just going to have it like this. So now going out and refreshing it, we shouldn't. Uh, the ghost should no longer run off the screen. And as you can see, uh, he does actually go through. So this is uh, this looks really good. I think we probably have to slow him down a little bit because it's probably going to be rather hard to catch. and maybe even bring down some of these numbers to make them change direction uh, quite a bit quicker. I can get rid of that and slow them down a little bit there. So just some minor adjustments and tweaking and you'll find you usually do have to do some um, adjustments tweaking to your calculations uh, but this does look like it's working a little bit better. This is a little bit more. Uh, he keeps finding out where I am and he is finding ways to get to me. Uh, and this is exactly what we want within our game to add in uh, challenges into our game. Uh, in the upcoming lessons we're going to talk about collision detection uh, so that we know that when actually the ghost has actually uh, detected us, collided with us, we're going to be adding in our power-up dot so we're going to place that somewhere randomly on the screen. Objective of the game is to get the Pac-Man to eat the dot and then eat the ghost to score and to make sure that the, actually the ghost doesn't eat the Pac-Man and uh, that's going to be the summary of our game. Uh, so for now what we're going to do is the upcoming lessons, uh, so it's just a minor tweak on that. Uh, upcoming lesson we're going to talk about adding in that power dot and then also um, doing the collision detection in the upcoming lessons. Within this lesson we're going to talk about adding in our power-up dot. Uh, so this is going to be another object that we're going to be placing on our screen and so that means that we should go over here and reproduce one of these objects because we're going to need quite a few of these. Uh, again the same so we're going to need those X and Y's um, we're going to need to place them somewhere randomly on the screen. We're going to also need one uh, power up. So we'll just call it power up. And for now, we're going to put that at false. And so now we're going to do, uh, we should change this as well, power it's going to call it power dot. So we're going to have an X and Y coordinate for our power dot. And we're going to simply draw a dot. If um, power up is zero, we're going to draw that dot. We're going to uh, do the calculations for it. Um, so if it's available, we're going to draw it. And if it's not available, then we're not going to draw it. 
and when it's not available that means that uh, the Pac-Man's eaten it and we're not going to be showing it um, at the moment. So going down here, much like we did with the ghost, when we render it out, uh, I want to do a quick check to see if um, if it exists. So just like we did with the ghost, so I'm going to shut close these ones down over here to m minimize them. It's not taking up as much space on the screen. And I'm going to do a check to see if power dot is power up. Uh, so if, in it, if it's false, which it should be by default, we go up here, we see that we did set power up at false. So here we can uh, get our random calculations. Uh, so we can set our power dot x and power dot y position. And then here again, I'm going to be using that my num It's going to be adding in 30 so I don't end up right at the top. And I'm going to do power dot y. And of course, you could adjust these to be canvas uh, uh, dependent on the canvas, these values. Uh, so, depending if you change the size of your canvas, uh, it can easily adjust as well. So, sometimes that's a good idea to keep as much as you can dynamic um, in order for accommodating adjustments and so on. Uh, so now one other thing we have to set this to true so that we don't create a whole bunch of uh, dots there. Uh, so now we've done our calculation there for the power dot and So now we can go down and we're actually going to check to see if the power dot exists and if it does, so this all up here has to do with uh, moving around the enemy. So over here we're going to see if the power dot exists, uh, then we're going to draw that out on the screen according to the position. So we're not necessarily having it uh, the same way that we're doing these images. Uh, so of course if you did have an image of the dot you could um, include that as well but for the purposes of what we're doing within this course we want to demonstrate just different ways how to draw on the canvas uh, so another way to draw on the canvas is again uh, that fill style because uh, we do want to set a particular color so I want to be yellow to be consistent with uh, Pac-Man games I believe the, the dots are probably uh, white or yellow in color, but for uh, this lesson we'll just keep it yellow. Um, and now what we need to do is we actually need to draw an arc. So we need to draw a circular, uh, a dot, um, circular fashion. Uh, so typically if you were to draw on the canvas, you draw a square or a rectangle. Um, and if we want to do something other than that, then we have to plot out the paths and uh, draw out the paths of where we want the connections to be made. So rectangles by default, I'm just going to draw a quick rectangle uh, just to illustrate how easy it really is to do a rectangle. Um, and what we're doing again, uh, similar to what we're doing before uh, with the drawing of the image. So we're getting an X and a Y coordinate. So if I wanted this particular uh, dot to show up certain x and y coordinate, I could do x and y. And then this is uh, the width. So the next coordinate is going to be the width. So if I wanted a dot that was 20, or a rectangular in this case, or if I wanted a square, I could do 20 by 20, refresh it, and we get this random position of the square. So not ideal for the game that we're doing because I do want to have that um, as an arc instead of uh, the rectangle. So a few more steps that uh, we need to do in order to accomplish this. Uh, we can see there within the Mozilla guide 
Uh, in order to draw an arc, so we do the x, y, we do the radius, the start angle, end angle, and whether it's anti-clockwise. So we've got this type of uh, value here, so 75 by 75. So this is where the positioning is. Uh, so it's 50, 0, 2 times pi. And that gives us uh, a circular object. And then all we'd have to do is fill that. And uh, we're doing this thing called begin path because we're actually drawing on the canvas. So we need to include that as well. So it's context uh, begin path. And this lets the canvas know that you're actually going to begin uh, drawing a path. And I'm going to update this to include that math pi times 2. And when you are drawing out paths, uh, you have to actually uh, close the path after you've, you've done drawing with it. And then after you close it, that's the point where you can actually fill it. So this should give us a circle. Going back to the guide here, uh, there's start angle, end angle, and um, the anti-clockwise. So I want to actually, I need to set the start angle to zero. And I think that that should, uh, should fix that a little bit. Of course, uh, the problem here too is that I've got fill of rectangles. So I've got to change that into arc. Uh, so my radius is going to be 20, which is probably going to be a little bit bigger than I need. Uh, but for now, that should be okay. Uh, so yeah, definitely bigger than what I want. And I probably do want to change this to be white. Well, I'd make this a little bit smaller. Refresh it. Uh, so this gives us our power up dot. And in the next lessons, we're going to be talking about how we can uh, determine if the Pac-Man is eating the dot and then if the Pac-Man's eating the ghost. So some really cool things coming up in the next lessons. So the first thing that I want to do is add in the collision detection with the power-up dot on within our game. So that's one of the things that we want to add in. When the Pac-Man goes over the dot, he actually gets to eat the dot. Uh, so collision detection on the canvas, uh, you have to do quite a bit of calculation. And this again, this is going to be something that's going to um, take quite a lot of conditional statements. Uh, so just looking at probably where the best place to add in this um, power up dot is maybe after we've even moved things around. Uh, when we've moved our enemy around, uh, we've got all of those calculations. So within here is where we're going to do collision detection. And this is going to be a fairly big uh, if statement. And then, of course, we're going to have to do one for the ghost as well. Uh, so if you are using one of the JavaScript engines, uh, usually they do have this type of stuff built in because uh, there is a lot of repetitive uh, parts of the code. And uh, if you're doing any kind of shooting, any kind of bullets or something like that, uh, so that does really get uh, complex because you're going to have a whole bunch of collisions in order to detect. And the only way to detect uh, collisions is to calculate where your player is located uh, and in this case where our power dot is located. And of course uh, we have to do a minus 10 on it uh, or maybe we could do a minus 5 because that's what our radius of the power dot is. So we have to subtract out half of the radius because uh, this is a center point. So the X and Y um, within the arc are, is a center point and it goes out 10 from around it. So maybe that was correct that the radius was 10. Um, so this is detecting to see if players coordinates uh, are less uh, than 
the power dots coordinates and we also have to check to see if the power dot x is less than the player's x and here we have to add in uh, 16 again to get that center point and do another check here to see if the player's y coordinate is less than or equal to the power dot y minus 10. And one more check to see if power dot y is less than player y plus 16. And if this is true, then for now we're just going to console log out hit. Uh, so hopefully uh, this calculation uh, should uh, create a square area uh, that checks to see if um, the player and the power dot are within that same uh, spacing. So I'm going to refresh that and hopefully now when I go over it we get a hit which it doesn't appear to be doing. Uh, so there's some, something wrong with the calculation. Oh, we did get a hit there. So, so it is slightly off. So we have to we have to make the actual uh, the actual boundaries a little bit larger. So I'm going to just bring this up to 16. And again, there's always uh, different adjustments that you need to do. So it looked like uh, it was slightly off there. So it's not probably the best position of the power dot. So that looked like it's uh, a little bit better there. There's always tweaking with the calculations. So it looks like it's uh, the boundaries are fairly uh, good. We need to probably adjust a little bit on this side of the dot. So what I can do to make it a little bit larger, increase that boundary. So the, the issue was coming in from the left hand side. And actually that so I ended up updating the code, uh, the calculation. I had to remove out that power dot minus 10 uh, and then also for X and Y. And now it looks like the hit is more accurate when I come near the dot. When I'm touching the dot, it gives me a hit. And that's exactly what I want to happen uh, within my code. So whenever I'm touching it, uh, right, right away I get the hit. And always there is, um, that calculation and working with it. Uh, and that's where I usually use console log to help me out with the different calculations and determining when I'm seeing a hit. Uh, so now that I've got this hit working, I can continue to write out the code and I can make something happen once, uh, once the collision is detected. And one of the things that I want to happen is I want the ghost color to actually change. And again, this is a good reason why we used it all within one PNG file where I can easily switch over to a different color and use that instead. So what I'm going to do for this power up, I'm going to set that one to false because I don't want to show that anymore. Uh, so the power dot is now false and I'm going to add in a few more objects here within the power dot. Uh, so we did have that false there. 
I want to have a P countdown. And right now I'm going to set that to zero. And another one I want to have is I want to be able to store a, um, a value for the old ghost number. Uh, so I added in these values and I'm going to reuse them uh, down over here. So again, um, I can set a countdown number using power dot and this one as well. So our countdown, we're going to go to 500. Uh, I'm also going to take the ghost number and I'm going to take this old ghost number and store that in there. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm actually going to change the color of it and I need to know what the original color of the ghost was in order to switch it back after the countdown finishes. So this is the countdown while the ghost is going to be edible by the Pac-Man. And now I can set this ghost number and I already know which number I need to set it at. I got to set it at 384 in order to be the blue ghost. And p dot x. So I can move these out of the way so that there's no collisions with it. And so now when I go back out, when I eat the dot, the dot should disappear and the ghost should turn blue. Uh, so a bunch of things we still need to add in. Um, I want the ghost actually to be flashing. I want the ghost to run away from me instead of come towards me. Uh, and then also we have to add in the collision detection with the ghost. So that's all coming up in the next lessons. And then of course we don't want this dot to appear while the countdown is still happening. Uh, so we want the, the dot to reappear after the countdown completes. So within uh, this lesson we're going to make the ghost flash back and forth. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to flip from this one to that one. And we're also going to be using the two different ghost variations. So have his eyes actually moving. Uh, so back and forth between those two. Uh, so we need to set a brand new value here. And I'm just going to call this flash. Or actually, I'm going to give it a value of 0. And go down here, and when we're writing it out, um, I'm going to do flash in there. And this will uh, make this one dynamic. And then we're just going to simply do kind of like what we did over here uh, when we were changing the mouth opening and closing. And this is the one that I'm looking for over here. Uh, so we're going to do a quick check to see if it's um, which uh, row it's on. And then depending on the row that it's on, we're going to actually adjust uh, the image that's being displayed. Uh, so we're going to do, so if this one equals 0, then we're going to set it to 32 and if otherwise if it's not equal to 0 we're going to set it to equal to 0. So this should give us that ability to have the ghost eyes moving uh, when we go over maybe that's a little bit too much movement uh, but now we've, we've got the ghost blinking. So we can either set it uh, 
We can set it to remove uh, from those eyes moving if we want to do that. Uh, so maybe that's a little bit too quick as well. Uh, so we might not want to do this necessarily. Uh, so the other option here is to see if if it's powered up and uh, then depending on what the power up is then we can change it uh, back and forth so let's or we can add this in within our countdown and because um, we do have a countdown there that we're going to be counting down so maybe we can add that in within the countdown and once that countdown finishes, then we're not going to be uh, switching between the two anymore. So we'll just do it that way there. So I'm going to add in uh, this countdown, a check of the countdown there, and see if it's greater than zero. And if it is, then we're going to continue with the countdown. To get it to reach zero. And I'm going to add in another value here in enemy and I'm just going to call it ghost eat. And I'm going to set that to false. And going over here whenever we've got our collision detection I'm going to set power dot ghost eat equals true. So while um, while the while it's powered up, um, we're going to have it as true. And the reason that we can't really use the countdown is because we need to be able to decrease this, and we need to have something to happen once it reaches zero. Uh, so probably a few different ways to achieve this, but for now what we're going to do is we're going to say if this one is true, then we're going to continue with our countdown. Until uh, the countdown reaches less than zero, and once it hits less than zero, and then this is where we're going to reset everything. So we're going to change this one to equal false. We're going to change the ghost number back to that original one that we had set. So ghost number, so this is going to change its color back. And we need to add in one more thing here that we need to check if this exists and we have to have so that we're not setting that dot and I'll just put that less than or less than five so now when I eat the dot there should be a countdown and eventually he should switch back to his normal color and then we get our dot back so now we've got our basic game functionality. We need to add in the collision detection with the ghost and we also need to add in uh, the ability for the ghost to run away from me uh, once I've eaten the dot. So that's, uh, that's coming up in the next lesson. So what I want to set within this lesson is I want that ghost actually to change direction uh, when we're eaten the, the dot when the collision has been detected, uh, we want the ghost to change direction. And this is going to be relatively easy to do. Uh, so we're going to do that here where we're actually setting the values. 
and we can do something simple right over here where we're gonna actually just multiply the enemy speed by negative one if if this is true so going back up here we're gonna check if uh, the power dot ghost eat is true and if it is true then we're gonna take our speed we're going to equal it by the speed but multiply it by negative one and that will give us the opposite value of what we had over here so this gives us the opposite value of what was happening over here by default uh, and this is exactly what we want so we want them to go in the opposite direction so once I eat this he should start moving away from me, uh, which is exactly what's happening. So that's exactly what we want, because uh, we want to be able to chase him. And now we want to have a collision detection to check if we're running into the ghost. Uh, so that's coming up in the next lesson. So much like we had our collision detection with the power dot, we need to have a collision detection with the ghost as well. So that was the power up collision detection. And this is going to be the ghost collision detection. And so we just have to make a few updates. And we're probably going to have to do some recalculation as well for this. So it might not be exactly the same uh, values. So there's a hit over there. And maybe for right now, we're actually not going to move uh, move the ghost around uh, so just and I comment these out to remove out his movement refresh it and so now we should be able to um, and this is uh, obviously a better way to detect the collisions just to make sure that everything is exactly where we need it to be And it does look like um, it is it is going to be off again. So when we're hovering over here, we're seeing that we're not getting uh, the the collisions that we need. The collisions are uh, slightly off and up. So there are some minor adjustments. We have to make uh, collision move over slightly, and it's just it's just not a big enough space that we're taking up. Uh, so we have to make some adjustments to that. So I did make some adjustments to it, and it does actually look like it's uh, working uh, much better. So I'm coming in from the left and the right, and then from the bottom. I still need to make an adjustment on the bottom uh, and then as well for the top so that looks roughly uh, correct there uh, so I have to take this same adjustment that I made and adjust uh, this one over here to have a larger value so that we have a larger uh, hit area. So I'm going to do the same value there of 26, go back down, and now when I come in from the bottom, I should hit uh, the ghost as soon as I touch on him. So everything looks really good with the collision detection. Uh, so now we can build out some additional functionality as to what's going to happen when we do detect 
the collision. Uh, so one of the things that we want to do is we want to check to see um, if it's uh, if it's actually the player that's going to win or if it's the ghost that's going to win. And the way that we're going to do that is if this is true, then we know the player scores. And else, then we know that the enemy scores. And so we had those scores that we did set up in the beginning. The G score is for the ghost. Uh, the score is for the player. So going back to where I just added that, So I'm going to increment G score if it's uh, the ghost and the score if it's the player that should get the points. So now we should see something happen with the points. And then if I eat the, the, the dot and if I go on top of them, I should see an increase in my score. Uh, so this is uh, working exactly the way that we need it to work. Uh, now going out to here. Uh, before I get the ghost moving again, I do need to add in some more stuff here because as we saw, it's not exactly ideal um, that the score continues to go up. We have to actually reset everything. Uh, so we can add in another uh, brand new function that can do the resetting of, uh, of the values for the player and, uh, and so on or we could just simply add them in here because we know that we've got uh, collision detection happening. Uh, so either way, uh, what we want to do is we want to reset the locations. So I'm just going to add that in here at the bottom. And again, this is depending on what your preference is when that particular action happens. All I'm doing here is I'm increasing the score. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply um, reset their positions. So I'm going to reset him to the player to 10 and 100 and then I'm going to reset the enemy's X. So I'm going to put them on the far side to 300 and the enemy Y. I'm going to place them at 200. And then maybe I can even set this to false. And then I got to remember as well that I need to reset uh, some of these values here. So maybe what I can do is I can set that to zero, leave that one, and let this particular function handle that. So going back over So it automatically resets us when the collision is detected. And of course this will look a lot better once uh, the ghost is uh, moving around again. It'll make a lot more sense. So it does look like everything is functioning as we need it to. And now we can remove out those restraints from the ghost and let them actually move around. So he's going to be free to move around. Uh, so we're running away from him. So the ghost scores. And then of course once I eat the dot then he's going to run away from me, try to get away. And So 
So, so there's a few other things. Uh, so maybe I can adjust my speed where I can speed speed up uh, my guy once I eat the power up dot. So we're just going to make some minor tweaks and adjustments in the upcoming lessons as well to make the game a little bit more easier to play. So a few minor tweaks that we still need to take care of within the game and one of them is this eye blinking. So we want to remove some of this uh, blinking of the eyes and we want to keep in the flashing of white and blue uh, when we're actually pursuing. Uh, so there's a few different ways to do this. We can make it flash and we can make the eyes move slower if we wanted to. So we could put in some type of countdown here uh, and whenever it counts to zero uh, we can set that. So um, I'm going to simply add in another value here. I'm just going to call it count blink and I'm going to give it a value of 10. And then move out down to here. And if count blink is greater than 0, And now I'm just going to increment that. Or decrease that. And then here I can put an else. And also, I can reset this over to be 10 again, or whatever value we want to set it at. So this is making their eyes move slower, and then of course the blinking is slower as well. So we can set it maybe to 20. So this is, has a slower movement of the eyes and also when we get to our power up button it's going to be slower as well. So it looks a lot more natural that uh, we slowed down the speed. And another thing that uh, just to tweak that, uh, I want to increase the speed of I want to increase the player speed uh, once there's been a power up. So going all the way over to here, so we've got our collision detection. We're doing player speed equals 10 and then here we're going to bring it back down to 5. So of course there's just different ways to tweak this. So now when we eat this we move a lot faster and it gives us the possibility to catch the ghost a lot easier. And again a lot of these tweaks it's uh, for gameplay uh, capabilities so when you ever create a game you should test it out uh, to make sure that it is functioning the way you need it to function. So again, these, these uh, power dots, they seem to be appearing a little bit too high. So i got to go over to the spot where create them, uh, check if it's on screen, and this was the issue there that I needed to add in that plus 30. So now they should appear below that space. It should no longer appear above anymore. And even to update the game, you can add in multiple ghosts uh, and they could operate independently of each other. Uh, and then again, once they get uh, the power up button, then you can pursue any one of those. So now within the game, we're going to actually add in a second ghost. So we're just going to call him enemy two. 
just to make it really simple and we can use most of the same values there and now whenever we're referring to it um, so here we're checking to see if it exists so we need to go back up here and do something like this so everything that we've done needs to be reproduced for the second enemy and uh, you can even create loops and arrays if you wanted to uh, in order to really to, to build out multiple enemies but for the purpose of this lesson we're just trying to keep it simple and we're going to see if uh, this one exists And then, of course, we have to uh, duplicate out all of that. And also duplicate out the image. And some of this we don't need to duplicate, we can just do and we don't need to duplicate out this check because uh, this this is going to be universal for both of them. And of course uh, over here as well, so wherever we're mentioning that uh, we just need to duplicate that out. And this one, we, we probably have to add in a second value there. So I'm going to scroll back up there before I forget and add in and see what uh, this looks like so far. So there's our second enemy. Uh, so he's not moving around yet, but when we eat the dots, so something went wrong there as well. So just going back out there. So we're going to refresh that and hopefully this time uh, both of them should shift off. So both of them turn blue so we don't have the collision detection uh, yet available. So we do need to get him moving around. So again it's uh, a lot of duplicating here. And of course, there are other ways to do that. Uh, so over here, uh, so actually this one we don't necessarily need to duplicate because we need to duplicate the whole collision detection. So it's not necessarily going to apply to both of them. So that was an instance where we differentiate between the two. But over here, it's going to be the same thing here that's going to be happening. Uh, and now to add in that movement. So movement again, there's quite a bit to the movement there. Uh, so probably maybe a better way if uh, we were creating multiple enemies, create some kind of function around there. Uh, but for again for now we're just going to simply just duplicate that out. So we're just trying to add in the second enemy rather quickly. Uh, so this is going to make sure that he doesn't run off the canvas. Uh, this is going to keep him moving around. Uh, the, the moving again that was 
Uh, so this is the direction that they're going to be going and the enemy moving is going to be the countdown and then this one has all of the same properties as that previous one where we've got the direction uh, we've got speed so that they can have different speeds and operate independently of each other so might have missed uh, some stuff so I'm gonna quickly go through here and then do a check just to make sure that it's working not, not sure exactly sure how I'm gonna know which one is which so I think what what I need to do I have to slow down their movement because they are rather fast and it is uh, pretty hard to actually catch them so that's something else that I should tweak with it and of course when you're making the game you don't want to make it too easy uh, but you don't want to make it too hard either so going out there I'm gonna slow them down just a touch and uh, also you could do something where it's leveling up so depending on uh, how many how many what the score is uh, it could change and that kind of thing could be dynamic as well uh, number of ghosts can be dynamic as well uh, so you could really uh, build out quite a lot of functionality here so another thing that I could do is uh, whenever it whenever we power up uh, that maybe I could get them to even slow down a little bit so they might be easier to catch so uh, within the next lecture I'm going to include all of the source code uh, for this so it's all JavaScript based all of the code is JavaScript uh, so you can bring the JavaScript code in and um, and even uh, create your own image uh, with a breakdown of different enemies and then the Pac-Man uh, so the ones that we're using right now are the first two for the ghosts and then uh, all of the Pac-Man movements and all of uh, just the the two the blue and the white for the ghosts here when it's powered up so again there's a bunch of different options here that are available to us and you are uh, welcome to build out the code as you need to and uh, create your own version of the same game using this as a as a base uh, to build out your own uh, version of this game